you know, a couple little things about me. I've been in this area and in business quite a while, 20 plus years, which is a long time to be doing business on the web and in digital. Uh, I've owned a few companies, grown a few companies, but the probably most two most important things for you to know about me. First of all, I've been a geek all my life. You know, this is me about eight, nine years old, Christmas, over the moon to get a Panasonic dot matrix printer. Anyone have a printer like this? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah and you know, you know, right, loud, not very efficient, better at producing decibels of noise than DPI of output, right? Yeah, but I was so excited to get this. Uh, and that's just how I've been wired since birth. Secondly, um, you mentioned I'm a dad. I'm a dad of triplet girls. These girls are actually in first grade now. And um, I bring this up because I'm not easily rattled. You know, uh, this, I had fun with them. This. So you ever been to a pumpkin chunkin? Yeah, you know what a pumpkin chunkin is, though, right? So one of my last companies, we, you know, you know, software and engineers, we build like the 20-foot trebuchet, and we're going to do a pumpkin chunkin. So these girls are three months old in this picture, taking their first pumpkin chunkin dressed as pumpkins. And I think this one was like... What is a pumpkin? I think Daddy's got plans. <laughs> but um, if you have questions, need to interrupt me. Tell me that you know your neighbor took your dessert or something. You know, do it. That's, those are the sorts of things that make me feel completely at home. And I want this to be a conversation to have fun with you guys. Okay. So we're going to talk about digital transformation and. Uh, some of the facets of digital transformation. And it's a tough thing to wrap your head around. So one of the tools that's been kind of building, I'm give you guys a sneak peek today, uh, is essentially a, a digital transformation meter. If you get a chance, you jot this URL down or you know, hit it on your phone. Uh, it's not meant to, to be a dashboard of sorts, but it is meant to, to drive a conversation. It touches on you know, 10 of the different facets of digital transformation. And it's a great thing to take back to your executive leadership team talk to your counterparts back at the office and get conversations going. Hey, are we doing this? Are we doing that? And it does give you an idea of all right, how far along are we in, down this journey, you know, um, like Jim mentioned. So what is it and why is it important? And if you guys have asked any of these companies what is digital transformation, you know you get a different answer depending on who you ask, right? You know, so I want to start out, we're going to try to create alignment around a definition uh, and also have a good understanding of why is it important. First spooky stat of the day. This is John Chambers, he was head of Cisco um, back in 2015 when he said this. 40% of all businesses will die in the next 10 years if they don't figure out this digital transformation thing. Yeah, and that was said three years ago, so the clock's been ticking, we've got seven years left, and 40% is a decent chunk of the people in this room. So this is something we need to pay attention to. I'm going to skip the normal time I spend expanding this, to, uh, this definition and kind of jump to it because I want to dive into the fun stuff. Um, but I want to have consensus in the room so we can all look at the next 30 minutes worth of content through the same lens. I propose that we define digital transformation as differentiating your business using digital technologies to gain strategic advantage. Now, there's a lot of buzzwords in there, so I'll unpack it a little bit. Differentiation for competitive advantage is probably a no-brainer. If you've read a marketing book like Differentiate or Die, that's basically what I've done as a marketer, um, you, know, you can pretty much line those up. If we have any leaders in the room, you'll know and agree right away that your business is not just the sum of your product and services, it's product, services, and your people. Right? And I see some people nodding in the room, so we agree there. And I'm going to change the word digital because you can't define digital transformation using the word digital, right? But I'm going to substitute the word software. So, and mainly it's because, in my view, the hardware has become highly commoditized. You know, it's been a, in the hardware game, it's been a race to the bottom in terms of price and margin for a long time. And if you're deploying some of the solutions like we might talk about in Internet of Things and other, the hardware is fairly ubiquitous. Everyone can go buy the same sensor to detect humidity, for example. But what you do with that sensor, how you apply it to your business, is all defined in software. So if we can agree that digital transformation is differentiating across the business, people, products, and services using software, then I think we're on the same page. So, the first scary topic, one of the facets that everyone likes to talk about with digital transformation is AI, right? Who here recognizes the names or the companies up here? 
a few of you, about half of the room is familiar and recognizes, you know, somebody, you know, some of them are really prominent out there. IBM Watson played on Jeopardy, Google DeepMind, and so on and so forth. Um, but there's still, what I've found, kind of a lack of understanding in what's the difference? How do I use this? What's the application? And what does it mean to me? And when you start talking artificial intelligence, some people think this right away, right? Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, right? Yeah. And we've got good reason why. So these were the headlines from uh, 2017 from New York Times, if you look up artificial intelligence. It's pretty sensational, right? Is AI going to take my job? Is it going to screw up my kids? Is it going to wreck my plane? You know, it, there's a lot of fear around artificial intelligence and where it exists today and what level it's been developed to. You know, and they, you know, people will come up and say, well, what about those robots that Boston Dynamics is you know, doing? You know, they had a new video recently where they're jumping upstairs and jumping over logs and this kind of thing. And you know, then we see this, and I'm like, okay, well, if you're going to build an intelligent robot and you don't want it to kill us all off and go Terminator, why are we poking it with sticks, right? Like, this is not a good start. But the reality is, most of these, oh, this one isn't playing, yeah, most of them have bad days more than good. And this it should be a video of the poor thing trying to pick up the box, knocking over the cart, falling over on its own, and just having a bad day. And, and the reality is, you know, they, have, they do a, a RoboCup, where they teach robots to play soccer every year. And it looks about like my kids playing soccer. You know? uh, and so, are we, are we approaching the robot apocalypse? Not quite yet. Um, but what do we need to know about it? Well, so first of all, there are differences between what's called general AI and applied AI. You know, general AI is that terminator that we all fear, you know, that can think like a human, problem solve, understand context. Applied AI really just has to do one task better or equal or better than a human counterpart. And it meets that definition of this is an applied artificial intelligence. We see that all the time. There are a lot of applied AI examples out there that have become pretty ubiquitous in our daily life. The OK Google, the Hello Siri, or Hey Alexa uh, is all voice recognition, speech comprehension, but for specific tasks. You can't ask them to do anything, but you can ask them specific things. Um, facial recognition, so on and so forth. Something that also comes up, and they say, well, what about machine learning? You know, so they, you know, the robots, they understand those simple tasks, but can't they teach themselves like more tasks now? Isn't that what machine learning is? Not quite. And it's also not a totally new concept. The notion of machine learning actually goes back to the late 40s, early 50s, with the idea of, okay, you know, if a human can teach a, a robot to teach a task, then can a robot teach it to other robots to teach it, you know, that task more quickly, more efficiently? And it's true. Um, and, and the way we've leveraged machine learning is interesting. We can have them perform specific tasks with surprising results in terms of quality, especially around video surveillance, natural language processing, and, and very specific tasks. And I want to give you some examples, and I've you know, cherry-picked some of these examples because I want to focus on the ones that get you thinking and are a little bit scary. So we're going to look at a couple of them. This one, not so scary, but really fascinating. This is a product that's been developed in collaboration between NTT East, which is a giant company, uh, and a small startup out of Tokyo called Eagle Eyes. Earth eyes, I'm sorry. And what they've done is they've used artificial intelligence and machine learning to take a 2D image in real time from a video and understand the skeleton inside. So understanding the pose of an individual. And then, and they're applying this specifically to shopkeepers in Japan, they can train that intelligence to recognize suspicious poses and suspicious behaviors. And it's off of a two-dimensional camera. So it's similar to what, if anyone has like a Microsoft Connect, you know, it's similar to that, but it's actually a less sophisticated camera, which means it's cheaper potentially to implement. And as such, by being able to do it in real time, track objects that it recognizes well, you can alert shopkeepers and so on and so forth. And of course, they couple it with facial recognition as well. In the shops where they've deployed this as a pilot in Tokyo, they've seen a 40% reduction in shoplifting and shrink. And the real kicker, what's really fascinating to me, the camera themselves only cost around $2,000, and the monthly service is 40 bucks a month. 
And so in that market, and you can imagine a lot of other scenarios, talk to folks about leveraging this on a construction site, for example, to attract tooling, materials, etc. Who here has heard of or uses their Google Assistant or Alexa or Siri? Use it a lot? Okay. And the Google Assistant folks in the room, have any of you heard of Google Duplex? So this is what's coming as a next generation Google Assistant. Now, I'm gonna, these videos have some audio, so I want to make sure that the audio plays. Um, as I mentioned, there are things that you can ask Google Assistant to do, right? Yeah, tell me the weather today, what's my first appointment on the calendar, set an appointment on my calendar, etc. But they're generally isolated. What they're teaching the assistant to do is now reach out and make an appointment for you, for example. So this is audio from a press event where they demonstrated the technology, and what you'll hear was, the command was, okay Google, make me a haircut appointment for May 3rd between 10 a.m. and noon, and the assistant calls a salon. Something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. You hear that nuance? Sure, what time are you looking for, Ralph? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. Can you give me one second? The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything for 10 p.m. and at 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's your birthday? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Great, great. Have a great day, Matt. Wow. Pretty impressive, right? And also a little bit on the creepy side. You know? <laughs> yeah, because the operator, you know, the human on the other end probably had no idea, or very little idea, that she was talking to a robot, all right? And it brings up a lot of ethical questions too. You know, in North Carolina, it's a one-party disclosure state if you want to record a phone call. Only one party on the call has to say this call is being recorded. But most states aren't like that. You know, that's why you call customer service and this call may be recorded for quality assurance. Should there be a law in place that says, all right, I'm a robot calling on behalf of Mike McTaggart? I don't know. Those are good questions to think about. So this was a pretty responsive and articulate um, human on the other end of the line. What if that's not the case? Here's another example. Hey, how many you? Hi, um, I'd like to present a table for Wednesday the 7th. For seven people? Um, it's for four people. Four people when? Um, what is that? At 6 p.m. Oh, actually, we need to go for like after like the five people. For people, people, you can come. How long is the wait you need to uh, be seated? Yeah. Tomorrow or weekday or? Or next Wednesday. Oh, no, it's not too easy. It's just a couple of people, okay? Oh, I gotcha. Thanks. <laughs> Even creepier, right? <laughs> you know, not only are they inserting the ums and the ahs and the things that make it conversational, you know, but to see that twist and anticipate and understand the context, be able to say things, oh, I gotcha, use a local vernacular, you know, very impressive. So artificial intelligence and machine learning is being applied to natural language processing and reproduction with some interesting and somewhat creepy results. So we move from audio and speech over to video. Has anyone seen some of the news stories out about deep fakes? I see some nods. Okay, so deep fakes, if you can imagine, I'll uh, use some, some somewhat technical terms, sort of creating an encoder and a decoder for a face. So we can say, okay, I'm gonna have to teach a computer to understand my face and all my expressions, and I'm gonna teach it to understand your face and all your expressions, and if I have those encoders and decoders, then I can make an expression and then the computer can reproduce that expression on your face. And that's basically the way it works. Except in this case, we can pick any face that we have a few hundred or thousand photos or video of. It could be President Obama. In this case, a guy much like me, but way smarter, his name's Sven after all, uh, recognized that his wife looks a little bit like Anne Hathaway. This is Anne Hathaway on The Late Show. This is his wife. 
there were a few thousand pictures of his wife available to him and plenty of media coverage of Anne Hathaway. And so he fed it into this application and said, okay, let's map both sides and see if I can't produce my wife on The Late Show, David Letterman. And it looks pretty convincing. I mean, this is a low-res you know, GIF. You, know, you can put them side by side even. And yeah, they're, you know, they're, they're similar in stature and build. But you wouldn't argue that they're, you know, they look like two different people. You know, and of course, there are a lot of deep, dark places that this technology could be taken, right? You know, thankfully, for the most part, the internet has a sense of humor, and they do things like this with Nick Cage. <laughs> Creepy. <laughs> or this one, which might be my favorite. <laughs> kind of crazy but, you know and what's interesting if you, if you start looking into it you know the realm and the boundaries around hollywood and the advanced you know cgi graphics and such are starting to break down you know they've actually used the same technology and you can spin up some compute power in the cloud pretty cheaply and, and quickly and uh there was a big controversy about henry cavill's mustache in the superman movie and it cost hollywood a bunch to remove the mustache from each frame this technology did it cheaper and faster. Um, reproducing Princess Leia in the new Star Wars movies, you know, they've shown that this technology can do it faster and cheaper. Um, you know, and hopefully it's not used for fake news and various other deep, dark, evil things. So, now that you're creeped out and will probably never get that image of Nick Cade out of your, out of your head, um, I like to say that SNIOT stands, in, stands for security. And I know that most of you have probably been spelling it wrong all along. Uh, but it's very much the truth in practice. And you can't have any talk, especially about scary things in um, digital transformation, without talking about security. Because, well, one in three of us was compromised last year. You know, some of us in a pretty severe way. And it's because it's gotten really easy to be a cyber crook. In fact, really cheap, too. If you don't like someone or have a beef with an ex-employer or a competitor, you can rent cyber criminals as a service and launch denial of service attacks, ransomware attacks, and so on. You know, and that activity, because the price point has gotten so low, has you know, gotten pretty you know, popular. And we don't help the equation any, right? Who's the weakest link in the cybersecurity equation? Yeah, it's, it's us. 80% of us will say, yeah, I knew I shouldn't have clicked that. But I did. Mm -hmm. So it's easy to exploit us. And the result is, attacks are on the rise. Uh, you know what a DDoS attack is? Have you heard that term? You probably hear it thrown around on the web. So DDoS uh, is, stands for Distributed Denial of Service. So if we were a physical office, think of it this way. Say I've got a building with 200 employees in it, and suddenly, unexpectedly, Thousands of people with megaphones come charging into the, uh, through the doors of my office, fill the building up, and they're all screaming at the top of their lungs. Highly disruptive. None of us can get any work done because I've got 12 people surrounding me, screaming at me, all, try, all asking me questions, try, you know, whatever. And it's, it disables, it would shut the business down, right? No business could function under that. Well, that's the equivalent of a DDoS attack, but on your network. Instead, you've got all of your computer network and your computer systems that are suddenly overwhelmed with inbound traffic, often amplified or magnified using various techniques. Okay? And so that type of attack can be crippling to a business. And it can be particularly effective when you want to ask for ransom because you can turn it on and turn it off. And you can let it go as long as necessary. In 2018, early this, uh, early this year, uh, you know, security researchers monitored one that lasted nearly two weeks. And that's why you can collect big revenue. And these numbers, sadly, pale in comparison to the actual financial impact. So it's one thing to be vulnerable as a targeted business. The ripple effect can be even more scary. Um, here's one example of a ransom that was nearly a million dollars. Of course, they were a hosting company. Once their network was uh, infected, that was the core of their business. Um, who remembers the uh, wanna cry and not pay you some of these breaches from last year? So we're still tallying all the numbers from the impact there. 
but local, the, the current tally is at least $18 billion of, of global financial impact from just these couple of, of pieces of malware. And they had, you know, generally speaking, across some of the companies you see on the screen, hundreds of millions of dollars of impact. And it hasn't stopped. So a recent example, in August, Thailand Semiconductor, who's responsible for a lot of the chips in your Apple iPhone, got hit with uh, WannaCry. Put, shut them down for two days, but they had to lower their uh, expectations in their quarterly report by nearly a quarter billion dollars. Um, I pray that none of you have seen this screen. This is a screen from NotPetya, at least one of the possible things. NotPetya was a particularly evil bug because it, sh it shows itself as a uh, ransomware attack. Pay some ransom and you'll get your data back, but there was no recovery. The data was forever lost, and a lot of the less sophisticated, less professional malware variants out there are like that. They're good at creating malware, bad at cryptography. And so they encrypt your data with no hope of getting it back. This screen, uh, there's a great article in Wired that describes the scenario of uh, an IT worker at the shipping company Maersk. You guys familiar with them? Yeah. So every, you know, you know the food that we eat, the packaging, you know, everything arrives on shipping containers, oftentimes reports like this, right? One of these ships can hold around 18,000 containers worth of goods. Maersk got infected by um, not Petya through a single endpoint. It spread throughout their network and shut them down as a global entity within two hours. That was 4,000 servers, over 40,000 computers and users, offline and out of business, told to go home for the rest of the day, and maybe until the rest of the week, within two hours. The result was a lot of this at a portion of the 79 or so ports that they operate around the world. Lines of trucks. All the trucks are there, all the ships are there, the cranes are working, but the computers can't tell us which truck goes from this boat to the, or which container goes from this boat to that truck. Hundreds of thousands of containers. The estimated uh, loss from Maersk is well over $800 million. And you think about the vulnerability of, right, these are all our goods, this is our milk, this is the supplies and the materials, they're all goods for my business. Sitting trapped on a shipping container somewhere, not able to make it off the ship or out of the port to where I need to use it. So, it segues us into what we call operational technology. A lot of you guys you know, work every day in IT, I'm sure. Um, some of you probably work some in OT. And so, that's your industrial systems, your ICS and, and SCADA systems. There are, there's been a lot less focus on this. And that's the reason I bring it up, is because um, I'll, I'll give you one specific example. In 2014, there was a vulnerability disclosed accidentally by the Department of Homeland Security called the Aurora Vulnerability. Okay? This is a video of it playing out. Basically, what the vulnerability allows you to do is access the control relays, and this is a two megawatt generator right now, and allow you to, once you have access to the relays, what you can do is switch them rapidly back and forth in such a way that it forces the generator out of phase. 180 degrees out of phase with the AC current. So it's kind of like going down the uh, interstate in your car at 100 miles an hour and throwing it in reverse. It causes permanent and irreparable damage to the equipment involved. You know, and this is a two megawatt generator. It's not the sort of thing you have spare parts or a spare unit lying around waiting to get installed. Weeks or months to replace this. The disclosure was, happened accidentally by the DHS in 2014. The first time we saw it in the wild was in 2015 in the Ukraine, uh, where it knocked out power for roughly a quarter million Ukrainians. They did it again almost to the day in 2016, and hit, I think, close to half a million Ukrainians. And for whatever reason, I certainly don't know, I'm not in that loop, uh, but the attackers only leveraged the first half of the exploit. They took control, they knocked out power, but they didn't go so far as to destroy the actual hardware. But they could have. They had the access, all they had to do was go to phase two. And so, you know, when I think about spooky, scary stuff, you know, these are the things that, that come to mind. Um, wouldn't be complete if we didn't talk about spear fishing and, and um, you know, fishing and whale fishing a bit. Who, who in here manages HR? Finance is the owner of the company. 
Yeah, we've got a few. So, so you guys are targets. And in fact, you guys, we would go so far as to not even say you're the target of a spear phishing attack where we try to single you out. You're what we would call whales. Because if we can catch a whale, that's even more lucrative. And they're getting smart. There's three things that usually they go after. They want to steal your credentials so they can get elsewhere. They want to take uh, like a payment on a fake invoice. Or they want to steal identity information via taxes. This is two examples. Fake website, dropboxforteams.com. Not owned by Dropbox. Real website on the right. Tough to tell the difference. Uh, they're getting better at you know, phishing for credentials by dropping logos and content in the emails that make them look really realistic. They also do sneaky things like take Hall and Lee Partners 1S.com and then buy the domain with two S's and send emails out from the executives from that domain. I wouldn't catch that, I'll be honest. It's just an extra S. It's easy to overlook. And a lot of them will go so far as to build a full profile. So when your email client goes and says, all right, who is this email from? It'll go ahead and pull down the headshot. And you know, what, what better way to build trust digitally than have faces of humans and friends that you know? Yeah. So uh, the other thing that they'll try to do, especially if you guys are in industry, and I'm just trying to make you guys all aware of this, uh, is what's called a watering hole attack. So you can invest in, in securing your infrastructure, right? I'm going to build my fort, I'm going to build the moat, I'm going to build the walls, I am safe. But what do we all do all the time? We consume media from other sources, and that's what we love to do. Especially if I'm at the top of my field or at the top of my company. I'm going to go out, I'm going to read the trade magazine for whatever industry I'm in. Well, that's a magazine publisher that doesn't really have anything to secure. Their network is weak. And so it's easy to compromise that network and embed malicious code in the PDF of next, next month issue. And now they're in your network and you invited them right in. It's called a watering hole attack. Yeah, so these are the sorts of things to be aware of. And you know, Department of Homeland Security and others are aware of that as well, but they're aware to the extent of, yeah, this is being used with a high degree of success and, um, you know, 50%. So um, about out of time, and we all know that pumpkin is coming. So I wanted to wrap up. You know, hopefully I've, I've uh, entertained, uh, made you aware, also maybe scared you a little bit. Um, as such, if you want to drop a card in uh, the mason jar next to my Duke pumpkin, go Blue Devils, um, <laughs> and, uh, I've, got, I've got some assets, you know, some security checklists and things like that I'd be happy to share with you, things that you, you can drive conversation back with your IT team, back at the office, etc. cetera. Uh, I'll, I'll even send you a pumpkin spice special edition. Uh, if you're interested. And then meanwhile, if you want to talk, I've actually got a couple members of my team here. We, you know, we offer um, pumpkin spice IT assessments, uh, pumpkin spice fractional CIO services. What else do we have going on? Yeah, we have specials. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, tis the season. So, thanks, guys. <laughs>